is I'm a legal office assistant instructor and what that exactly is is we teach high level computer skills to get ready for um, a position in a legal office and also we teach about the legal specialties, the specialties of law such as you know, family law, the different court systems and we, we specialize and we meet and we talk about the different specialties of law but then there are a lot of um, computer work. So that's what we do. Thank you. Sarah? Um, well, I started out as an accounts receivable clerk. I was placed at the company that I'm at um, from Brian and Stratton when I graduated. Uh, there was just two people in our finance department. I was employee number 35, and we're now almost 600 employees 13 years later. So I've just been able to, as the company's grown, I've been able to grow with the company and move up the ladder in our department is now 13 people and I'm the director of that department. So it's it's uh, it's been a, a slow process, it's been a learning process along the way. Um, I think I've probably learned more from the position than I could ever learn in a, in a, in a school environment. Um, my specific job requirements are to ensure accurate financial statements to the executives, tax filings and credits. I work with our clients in our IT department on special reporting, and I also lead our yearly and client-specific audits. 
So as my bio said, I'm manager of human resources for Klein Steel. Um, I basically do everything that involves the employment life cycle over the course of uh, some employment there. So everything from work with the managers to find out what our staffing needs are, looking at job recs, recruiting for those positions, onboarding those folks, making sure they get the proper training, um, employee relations, compensation, benefits, um, all the way to the hopefully never the end, but there is end at some point. For some folks, they will have to let someone go or they voluntarily leave, and everything in between. Um, how I got into HR, um, kind of a haphazard, I guess. I, my previous background was health and fitness. I worked in that industry for about 12 to 13 years. I'm sort of get a burnout by long hours and the folks who want the magic pill who just want to get fit overnight. So I talked to my HR person at Wegmans at the time and said, I need a different career path here. And they said, well, how about working with the youth? So they uh, actually created a job for me as a job coach for the inner city. So I work with high school juniors and seniors to get them a career within Wegmans. So that's how my foot on the door of HR and it sort of has blossomed since. Well, I'm director of student accounts over at Roberts Wesleyan College. And student accounts is basically a bursar's office or a billing office. So I guess bottom line, which a lot of people call and ask, what's my bottom line? What do I have to pay? Um, bottom line is we're responsible for the timely and accurate uh, billing statements that go out to students who attend the college. Um, a lot of time by myself is spent um, managing the systems, making sure that uh, the billing is, is accurate, making sure that the system is set up correctly to generate a bill. I manage a team of four other representatives that deal a lot with students, working with them on their personal finances, um, collaborating with financial aid to make sure we get those funds to pay the bills. Um, also, I have a collections representative on my team that you know, sometimes people fall into that need to go to a collection agency, so we deal with the, you know, the, the collections of those particular funds as well, too. How I got started in this particular position is Robert's was a very interesting place that I have always kind of wanted to, to be part of. Um, uh, finance and billing systems are something that I had a, a background in. Um, being an, an HR professional prior to this, um, I had a good leadership background. So for me, it was the tagline of being able to continue on as a leader and learn some new things and really work with students. Um, that's what really drives it home for me, but that's how I got I would have to say probably attention to detail, being organized, obviously, if you're in a finance position, um, being accurate, being able to back the numbers that you have with uh, more specific information, having a positive attitude, and most important is adaptive to change. Uh, as I mentioned, the company has grown um, from 35 employees to 600 employees over the next 13 years, and we plan on adding another 150 employees in the next year. We're constantly changing the way we're doing things. Um, we're an accounts receivable management company with our concentration highest in student loan defaults, but there's always changes, um, government changes, and how those loans are being administrated. So we're always looking for new ways of doing things, staying in compliant, um, keeping our integrity. We have been on the Rochester Top 100 list. We have won business and ethic awards, and we're the top 100, or the top agency to work for in accounts receivable management. So we need people with positive attitudes. I've hired a lot of people along these 13 years, and it's not always education. A lot of it is your personality, um, how you're going to be willing to work as a team, how you're going to be able to, be able to work for the company. So HR, in my opinion, a couple, a couple things come to mind. Uh, the first for me is integrity and trust. Um, as an HR professional, you're, you're dealing with a lot of sensitive information, both for management as well as employee relations. Um, many times you have employees come to you with an, an issue or a need where they're concerned about their management team, and you have to hold that close to you and do something with it in an appropriate manner. At the same time, you know, management has certain decisions they need to make that affect other people. You need to hold that very tightly as well. So trust is a huge thing at all levels across the organization. Along with that is communication skills. Um, you need to know how to talk to all levels of your organization, whether it's the entry-level person all the way up to the president of the company, and how, what is their personality style, what are their hot buttons, how to, how to talk to them appropriately but still get the message across they need to. Um, those are two big ones. I mean, dependability and accountability. I mean, we could go on and on about different qualities, but I would think the trust and the communication are probably the two biggest. Um, another big one is, you know, empathy. Um, your role as HR, you have to really understand where someone's 
coming from their perspective, um, especially when uh, they have a life need and they come to you and it's a challenge, you have to have that work-life balance issue. How do you balance out the business needs with their personal needs? So really putting yourself in their shoes and understanding where they're coming from. Thank you. I would definitely say organization skills um, as well as uh, good time management skills. Uh, I mean, when you're working in this particular job, you're helping students with their finances. And as we know, finances, it's, it's a tough thing out there nowadays to be able to pay these bills. So I think playing off of empathy as well, too, definitely being able to have empathy, understanding, being able to effectively communicate. Um, a lot of times people will call in and they will not understand how their financial aid works. They will not understand how the billing process works. So it's a lot of effective listening, um, understanding exactly what they're trying to ask or what their issue is, um, and then being able to effectively paraphrase that, that question back to them and help them um, to the best of your abilities. So I think definitely organization, time management, communication skills are going to play heavy in any kind of finances field because it, it's almost an education type position. I mean, we're in education, so but you know why wouldn't we be educating? But um, you know, we're educating people on their finances, on their bill, how to pay that, working with people um, in difficult times. Like I mentioned earlier, I sort of got in the HR field through a different I didn't purposely set out to be in HR, but I did have a bachelor's degree in education at that time, so I used that education knowledge to apply toward the HR field. Um, since that point, my last 12 years of HR, I've seen all different folks come in with different experiences in education. Um, I would say at least a, an associate's degree if you're looking to get in the HR field um, to sort of get that base level knowledge of how, how do business functions, what are the basic functions of HR, to get some of that background from you. From there, you can move up into a generalist role and at that point pursue a bachelor's degree and also some professional certifications, uh, the professional and human resource certification through uh, Sherman, HRCI is a great one to have. The SPHR is the next level up. Um, but there's so many, so many different certifications out there. You don't really have to have a degree. It definitely does help, though. Thank you. I would definitely say for this particular role, um, I would believe probably a baseline of at least an associate's degree and some sort of either a business or a finance background would definitely help. Um, because you'll have a lot of the basic how accounting works. So in a lot of my job, I work a lot with accounting uh, in regards to accounts receivable and accounts payable. So I think having that basic knowledge of how you know accounting works and the terminology will definitely help. Um, it would also help if you've had at least maybe a year or two of experience, maybe either working in collections or even working in a bank. A lot of the people that we have that work as part of our finances team are, are people who worked in, in the banking uh, industry beforehand. Um, so I think definitely that would help, um, you know, for the director type level, you know, maybe more of a bachelor's, um, more of that, that undergraduate degree would definitely help. Um, but, you know, then again, I mean, somebody with, a, a, you know, a, a heavy amount of experience could do the job if, if they really, really you know, set their heart to it. Um, you know, just working in HR and recruiting prior, prior to this particular role, I, I found some of the best placements I made were people that really had that gusto and really believed that, you know, they had the skills that were transferable that, that, that could make them a success in that particular role. So I think definitely for, for this particular role, probably an associate, so you've got that baseline knowledge. Um, if maybe a bachelor's, maybe overkill, but um, you know, I think definitely an associate would, would be. Yeah. Um, for my role as an instructor, um, I, I do a lot of uh, Microsoft work. PowerPoint, Excel, Word, Access, and Outlook. So I am Microsoft certified, Microsoft Office certified, expert level. So I think that helps. But a big part of my job is confidence building. Where we get a lot of people that have been um, displaced from their employment, and they're actually afraid to go into a new field. They're afraid to come into training. So that is a big part of my job is that confidence building along with the computer skills. And I think um, for my position, um, I have an associate's degree, but much of what I do is self-taught computer skills um, and that confidence building. So for, for my position, I think an associate's degree with, with a strong background in the legal field. I did work with my brother. Um, he is an attorney for several years before I actually got into the paralegal training. So. 
um, for an entry level position in our accounting department. An associate's degree is not required, but it's preferred. Um, experience is really what we're looking for. Probably uh, like in a bank teller or some type of clerk experience where you have um, heavy accounts receivable. Once we get more into our GL accounts payable, we are looking for an associate's degree. Then we, once we get into the management or director positions, financial analysis position, uh, is, or a bachelor's degree is usually required. When we were a smaller company, um, like when I started out, I had only an associate's degree and I was able to kind of move up with just having an associate's degree. I am a few credits away from a bachelor's degree, but the experience that I had with the company and being able to learn the things as I go and as the company's grown, I feel like I've probably mastered in my field just from the experience that I've had really from building this accounting department from the ground up. Well, I mean, for example, in my particular field, if I was to hire a financial uh, you know, services representative or student accounts representative, you know, I, I think if an applicant was looking to apply for that particular role and they had banking skills or something like that or, or some sort of finance skills, I think the key to it is really reading that job description and looking for those key words. And I know it seems like a lot of work, but you really have to tailor your cover letter. You really have to tailor the bullet points on your resume to really highlight those skills of which you have that are matching that job seeker's job description. And whatever is transferable, maybe, you know, for example, if you have, uh, you know, experience of building websites or whatnot like that, and you know HTML, you know, make sure that that transferable skill is on your resume. Because definitely that's a key word that, you know, that we'd be looking for as hiring managers um, in choosing you for somebody that maybe we want to see, you know, as a, as a candidate or an interviewee, so to speak. Um, but definitely anything that, that you have from past jobs, I mean, even schooling that you may have, internships, volunteer, you know, opportunities that you, you function before, make sure that those skills shine on your resume because they're only going to add, you know, a more robust experience to you know, your skill set and make you shine as an applicant when you're applying for different positions. Um, we really believe that that resume is, is, is the key to getting that interview, and we also believe that the cover letter is the key to getting the employer to read the resume. So it's kind of the cover letter is going to sell your is going to sell the idea of reading your resume. Your resume is supposed to sell the idea of calling you in for an interview. So it's really important to have that resume that's clear, concise. Make sure there's no typos on it. Um, if you can put any certificates of achievement, attendance awards, training, seminars, um, just to show the potential employer that you're going to be the asset that they're looking for. How can you benefit them? Not how they can benefit you. Yeah, we all want a job, but how can we benefit the employer? So use your background as an asset. A lot of people, um, they come to our program. I teach an office program. They come to our program from a different background. And they feel like they're never going to be able to get into a different type of field because they have a, um, possibly a manufacturing background. Don't um, use your background as an asset. Um, a lot of those trainings that you've done, attendance awards, it's going to really, it's going to be a big selling point on your resume. As far as your cover, cover letter, if your skills don't directly relate to the skills that they're requiring, I would recommend explaining how the skills you have indirectly give you an edge of being able to learn these skills effectively. For example, if they're looking for a accounting software package, you know, you, you must have great Plains Dynamics experience. You could explain, well, while I don't have that experience, I project-led our company uh, migration from QuickBooks to Peachtree five years ago. I was able to pick up the new, you know, the new product. I attended training. So just that they can see, although you don't have the experience that they're looking for, you are adaptable and you will do better. So when you're looking for directly, 
relate to what to what you have, I would definitely put how they could indirectly relate to that. I well, so <laughs> um, I agree with it 100%. It's really needed to clear your, your skills to whatever the job you're applying to. For instance, in HR, there are such a diverse number of positions that could be a benefits analyst to the manager of HR. There are definitely two different focuses. So if you're going for a benefit analyst type position, they're looking for someone who has that financial, analytical mind, the background, a compliance mind, or someone who's in relations with you very focused on a go between and the So you really want to highlight those transferable skills. Um, Customer service, no matter what position you're in, you always have a customer somewhere out there. So really showing what you've done to meet your customer's needs is a big aspect. Um, at the end of the day, people are people. You know, machines have not taken over the world yet, and it never will, but we, we all deal with someone in our day, whether it's a, someone who reports to us or someone we report to. So how do you use those skills to, once again, meet the, the needs of your business? I think um, continuous self-learning, uh, read blogs, news articles online classes. That's a great way to keep your skills up to date. Um, let's see. Join networking groups. Uh, I'm sure some of you have done that. And also join an online professional group. Yahoo Groups has a lot of different professional groups. And our legal office students actually um, are required to join a paralegal online group that's through Yahoo. Just so they get familiar with the terminology and, and how everything works. And also, um, practice typing. For a person that's going to be working in an office, typing is extremely important. A lot of our students feel that it isn't very important, so we make sure that they practice a half hour a day, 20 minutes a day, as it is important. And also, um, there is a free learning website that many of you might want to take advantage of. It's called learnfree.org. And this um, website, there's word training, there's PowerPoint, there's access, there's all sorts of training, and there's computer basics on there, there's money management on there, so it's called learnfree.org, and it's a great resource. Yeah. Um, also, I'd recommend, if you have the time, to intern, if you don't currently have a job in your field, even if it's part-time, you know, our company does it all the time. Um, we currently have three interns in our company, not just our finance department, but in the company as a whole. So we're always uh, taking on that. And it's a win-win. It's a win for the company and it's a win for you. It gives you, you know, your experience and it allows us to, you know, get somebody in that, you know, we don't necessarily have to have on our payroll. So it's, it's definitely a good thing to do. Also, uh, volunteering is a treasurer or finance officer for an organization. Uh, you know, if you have kids and they're on a sports team, they're always looking for a treasurer or somebody to, to manage the team. That looks great on a resume. It also well rounds you. It looks that you. It looks as though you're, you know, you're interested in this field, not only just for a job, but kind of who you are as a person. That's just who you're. It's what you're like-minded. So I think that's a great thing to do. In the HR field, there's a lot of opportunities locally and nationally for keeping your skill set up. Genesee Valley Chapter of SHRM, which is the Society for Human Resource Management, there's a national SHRM chapter, SHRM organization, the National Human Resources Association. And they'll always have great seminars at least once a quarter, if not once a month. The local RBA has Friday business briefings twice a month that talks about HR related skills and topics. Um, volunteer, be a part of an HR advisory committee, such as one of the works. Um, just continuous learning is such a critical aspect, especially when you've been certified in HR. You actually have to meet certain requirements every three years to be sure that you're maintaining your skill sets. So if you don't meet, maintain those educational components, you don't maintain your certification. And that is kind of a critical component for showing that you're credible. It's hard to follow all that. <laughs> <laughs> I think definitely, uh, you know, the good news is you're here. So that, that's step one. I mean, that, that's part of remaining linked into, uh, you know, the community of professionals that are that are seeking, that are working uh, in the profession that you're interested in. But I think definitely remaining active in the community, for example, if you're interested in getting a job in finances, uh, remaining, you know, LinkedIn is a great tool for networking, networking with people in that profession to learn of the trends. Maybe you see that there's a huge trend and rise for people who need programming skills in Java or something like that. So then you go out to a community uh, school, uh, you know, you go to Boses or Roberts or, or wherever and to, you know, you, uh, you take a class and you learn that and you add it to your resume. Uh, you can do volunteers, uh, 
opportunities. You can you can internship at different organizations. I know, you know, a lot of the businesses that I've worked for, we would take an intern in a heartbeat, to, you know, to help us uh, with different projects, and we learn things too. Um, I think another opportunity is I worked many years for a staffing agency, and a lot of times you can get an entry level position, but learn a lot about what's going behind the scenes. Plus, you get paid for it. So, I mean, you, you talk about a volunteer, you know, opportunity where maybe you go in and you're not getting paid, but you're getting paid in that experience. Um, maybe a staffing agency might be a good way to go to kind of bulk up your resume a little bit in regards to skill set wise. And sometimes they do have skill assessments that they can give you. Um, places like Rochester Works can help you gain different skills. Um, so I think it's really remaining, you know, you know, active within the community, learning and keeping your ear to the ground with what trends are out there. Um, you know, venues like LinkedIn, um, a lot of the groups around town are, are definitely great ways to go and remain up to date on what's going on so that way you can stay ahead of the game with regards to your skill sets. Um, I'd have to say probably the most common is not having relatable degrees or experience where it looks like somebody is looking for a change in their career path. They may have a, they may be a certified truck driver and now they're looking for an accounting position um, or they have a degree in, in HR and now are looking to become an accounting manager um, where they're both administrative positions but an HR position or an HR degree does not teach you about debits and credits or, you know, an accounts payables, you know, process. If someone's looking to make a, a career path change, while you don't necessarily have to have an associate's or a bachelor's, you should at least be able to show that you've had some kind of training, that you've put some thought uh, in a serious step into making that kind of career path change. It's not, well, I need a job, here's an accounting position, so I want to make a change into accounting. It should, if you're making a, a, a path change, a career path change, you really should make it look like you're taking it seriously on your resume. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, you wouldn't want me doing your thoughts or your checkbook or anything as an HR professional, but um, you need to show those transferable skills like we, like we talked about earlier. You know, many times I have folks come to me, you know, when they have an opening for an HR, and they say, well, why do you want to be an HR? Why like people? Well, that's a small portion of it. There's a whole other world of relations out there other than just I like people, okay? And that's such a, it's a, it's a, it's right here almost every time I interview someone. <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's unbelievable. But you've got to show, you know, well, what, how are you, we talked about earlier, how are you going to benefit the company? How are your skills in tune and aligned with that company's culture, their values? Um, even if not just HR, just in general, when you're applying to our company, you know, they show, oh, I have this background. Well, that's great, but once again, it's not in line with what we're looking for. So really do your research and understand what is that job description. Even how they set an exploratory interview, that's not always going to be what they position in mind, but get to know the company a little bit better. Try to do some of the tour if you can. Um, Funny story, I had one person one time for an interview and I asked her, you know, why do you want to be in HR? And she didn't say I like people, she was the exact opposite. She's like, well, I like the compliance aspect of it. What do you mean by that? Well, I like making sure we discipline and fire people. So you have the people who love people, and you have the people who like to fire people. Neither one of those folks became on our team. So it's really about knowing what you're looking for as an organization and applying your skills to that organization. Definitely, I'd have to agree with that as well, too. I think definitely. When you're a job applicant, you're, you're selling yourself. So, you know, why are you the best person for this particular job? And I think in answering that question, you really have to do your research in regards to, you know, that, that, that job description. I mean, you really have to religiously read that and commit to that and, and, you know, how do I meet these skills? And you should be answering that question really before you're even applying because you don't want to shoot yourself in the foot and then, you know, get in there and, ah, I like people. You know, you know it's not going to help you. But I think definitely a trend that I've seen in applicants that are lacking skills, I think technology. I mean, I think we have a huge base of, of young applicants that are just fresh out of college with all this computer knowledge. They grow up with this technology. And then we have a huge amount of adult populations going back into the workforce for whatever reason and just weren't exposed to that technology and just don't know how to function with it. Um, you know, for example, when... I used to work for a hospital a, a while back, and we went to electronic medical records, and it was like the fall of Rome. You know, you know, nobody knew how to. I, I'm not going to quit. You know, I don't know how to use the computer. I, this, what is iPad? What's this? You know, so it, it just, you know, it, it got out of control. You know, 
And, uh, you know, it's, it, it's kind of that, that, you know, if you are up to speed with those particular skills, I think that's definitely going to help, especially we have a lot of um, modular programs, which are adult graduate programs, where people come back for organizational management or nursing or, or whatever they like. And I think they're heavily, you know, inundated with technology-based classes because that's just a skill that I think is, is lacking out there for whatever reason great skill to have and being able to broadcast on a resume or advertise on a resume that you have this, you know, oh, wow, this person knows EDP payroll software. Great. You know, I want, I want to talk with this guy, you know. So. How many of the skills that are needed in the office are those high-level computer skills? So we see that um, as some of the applicants are lacking those skills. So again, um, go to that learnfree.org, go to some online classes for Word, PowerPoint, Excel, those are probably the most popular. Um, we're also um, finding that people are losing the English grammar because everybody's texting now. Uh, <laughs> texting and also the spell check. You know, a lot of people, they really rely on that spell check. And as we all know, there's different forms of words that are spelled correctly, but they're used differently. HR perspective, like I said earlier, people are people. You have to have folks to run the job, right? So there's always a demand for an HR person within an organization, whether it's a, you know, an accounting manager doing some HR responsibilities, all the way up to an, a true HR professional. Um, whether it's a big company, small company, you have to have someone who is that liaison between management and everybody else. So there's always a demand for an HR professional in the organization. Um, as far as what's, you know, different sections or sectors of the industry, I mean, across the board. You know, I work in manufacturing now, but I've worked in hospitality, I've worked in retail, I've worked in fitness. And the same thing, people are people. I keep saying that, but it's true. You have to have someone who understands and communicate. You can work with folks so that they're all driving the boat in the same direction and running the same speed to get to where we want to be at. Okay. I think definitely from a, from a money perspective, finances perspective, I think I would probably have to say, I mean, as the economy rebuilds, I mean, I think financial anal you know, analysts, um, you know, just, you know, billing specialist collections is on the rise. Um, I think, you know, banking, you know, as, as companies are looking to rebuild and invest more, I think those, there's a surge in those areas within finance. I've seen a lot of people want to come, you know, nursing is huge. Um, just having come from a healthcare background prior to working at Roberts, um, you know, nursing, LPNs, uh, you know, CNAs, that, that's huge right now. So if you have more of a, uh, you know, kind of that science background and that empathy and, and you want to help people, uh, definitely that may be a good role for you. Um, obviously, sales is always huge as the economy and companies are trying to look to rebuild um, to, you know, gain that uh, the economic growth, so to speak. Sales is always going to be huge. But, uh, you know, things like financial, you know, financial analysts, uh, collection specialists, even to go outside that, maybe even nursing, uh, are huge areas that are just on the rise right now that I can see from, from my aspect of the world. Um, I, we, we actually um, are training for three office careers, medical office, legal office, and administrative office. And our students have been getting jobs. Um, our medical office is usually the program that is the most full. Everybody hears medical, and they want medical office. Um, but all of, our, all of our programs are on the in-demand list, the Department of Labor in-demand list, um, in-demand occupation list. So I would definitely go to that list and see what's available. Um, and if you ever do get a chance to look at the list, it's broken down into regions. And it's broken down. It tells you the average money and the skills needed. And our students, um, our office students, our office career students are becoming employed usually about... 11 to 16 dollars an hour usually with benefits so if you want to go that way there are jobs out in the office careers field as the you know, economy and businesses seems to be repairing i'll agree that um, professional business service occupations are on the rise uh, especially in analytics people want to get an edge um, in their competition so i know in, in just in our field in our company 
we've added to um, people specializing in our business analytics, and we're going to be hiring three more. So that sector of our finance department is going to double over the next year. We want to make sure that we are on the, the leading edge of, of our competitors. Uh, also with sales and marketing, that's one of the other big booms that we're going to have in our in our company. And I think it's that's true across all industries, is everybody wants to know how they can get their information out there to the public in, in the best way. So I think that's, a, that's something that's really going to be on the rise. I would think definitely for somebody looking to get into finances, just localized to my particular profession and where I am right now with Roberts, I think the most entry-level position would be somebody getting a job as a, as a financial services or a, or a student accounts representative um, and working their way from there to maybe a senior rep type role, um, going on from there and promoting up to maybe an assistant director type role and then to the director type role. Um, from there on and above, uh, you're probably looking at a VP type role, um, and then going from there, the hierarchy would lead to maybe like a president of finances or what like that role um, within our organization. That's kind of the hierarchy of how things go. Um, to land that particular role, I think maybe we, we kind of covered that already. But I think you know either you know somebody with either an associates um, with you know one to two years experience in some sort of a financial market would would do well. Uh, in a, in a finance, uh, in the, the entry-level role, once again, the associate isn't required. Um, I believe that somebody probably with a, with a good high school diploma and a good solid base of experience uh, would do fine in that role. There's a lot of learning. It's a very specialized industry, so you're not going to come in knowing everything. Uh, you know, the first couple of weeks on the job, it, it's going to be like we're all talking Latin. You know, there's just so many acronyms and different things. I remember when I started there, it was it was insane. I, it didn't, people weren't speaking English. You know, but, um, but definitely, I think that would be the career path for somebody that, that wanted to get into that type of role that I'm in. The other thing I want to say about that question is when a person is employed in a company and your company offers you any kind of training, you should jump right on it. It's going to give you more marketable skills, plus it's going to show your employer that you are ready to learn, you're willing to learn, you want more responsibility. Um, if someone were looking for an entry-level position in my field, I would definitely be starting out as a clerk, whether it was a accounts receivable or accounts payable clerk, uh, something entry-level that also, and I know entry-level kind of comes with a negative connotation, but it also gives you the opportunity to learn more about the company. Um, I started out as an accounts receivable clerk. Uh, we're an accounts receivable management company. So accounts receivable is the most important function of our finance department. I've worked very closely with production, client care, uh, and our IT department. So I learned more from doing our accounts receivable than I did from when I was promoted up to accounts payable. And then I was really just working with incoming invoices and you know making sure that the, the things that we were being billed for were received. But starting at an entry level, I wouldn't uh, think of that as being something where I'm taking a step down to further my, my way up. It really is an opportunity to understand what the company is doing. It's an opportunity to do something that you feel you can do confidently and really show off, hey, I can do this, but, but look at how well I'm doing it. I'm, cap I'm capable for more. So if you have to start out in an entry-level position, just see it as a way to really spring your way up. up quicker, I think. Okay, great. I couldn't agree more. I, for HR, you, you sort of come into HR usually one of two ways. You come in as a uh, general or an HR administrator, uh, really understand the basic processes of HR, you know, how do you process payroll or separations or new hire paperwork, things like that. Or you come in as a specialist, a benefit specialist, a recruiter, so really focus on one aspect of HR. Um, you, can, you can get those positions with, you know, associate's degree or just basic experience in business. And there you can progress into more of a generalist role, and a representative role, where you're actually handling off more of the day-to-day -day transactional duties of HR and having some employee relations and some more higher level benefit exposure. And there, of course, then you can get into management, and you're doing the employee relations management or benefits manager or HR manager. And of course, then there's always the, the VP or C-level positions in HR, 
well. Those are going to require a little more time, experience, and probably an advanced degree, and also certification. Um, but from my perspective, it's been a great career change for me. Like I said, I transitioned from a fitness background um, into a job coach role that was created for me. I had no idea what HR was other than I like people. <laughs> <laughs> and it worked out. Um, but there are, once again, transferable skills you can make. Um, I, I said again, upgrade those computer skills, training, 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 any training that you can take. Um, read about upcoming trends in the workplace. Um, try to involve, get into trends in your workplace. Subscribe to e-newsletters and blogs. Join professional groups. And finally, be a lifelong learner. Never stop learning. Thank you. Um, I would have to say, show that you're not complacent and that you still uh, are making innovative changes. We're always looking for smarter, a way of working smarter. We're a company on the move. One of the most important questions I ask in an interview is, what innovative change have you made in the current position that you're in? And I want details. You know, I don't want just to, oh, well, I did this and, and it worked out great. I want to know how you were involved, uh, what research you did, uh, really showing that, yes, you know, I've, I've just managed a company, I've managed an accounting office for the past 13 years. Okay, well, what happened over those 13 years? What, did the company evolve? Did you grow? Did you downsize? How were you a part of that? So, um, I, don't, I don't think there's ever a, a point um, when she said that you're going to stop learning or you're going to have to stop changing. So, I really try to, try to focus on that things I see is, uh, we mentioned already, with the technology aspect. I mean, technology is changing so rapidly, we need to be connected. I mean, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, I mean, there's so many different social media outlets out there, which is the right one. And for professional, I'd say LinkedIn is the first and foremost, that is where the biggest networking opportunities are. Um, and with networking, you know, not just through social media, but face-to-face -face is a key component. You know, who, who knows you and who they know, because that's where a lot of introductions come from, is a mutual professional associate. Uh, we get so many exploratory interviews at clients still because someone knows somebody, and they usually will turn into an opportunity for that person. So it's not necessarily always what you know, it's also who you know, and making sure you use those connections. And one thing we are interviewing, one thing I like to see is when people don't necessarily talk about what they're running away from, but what they're running toward. You know, what are you looking for in your pursuit? What, what do you want out of your career in that aspect? Not so much why you're running from the negative aspect behind you, but what are you running toward? just kind of to reiterate on what everybody has said so far, you really have to be a sponge. I mean, with regards to learning, I mean, you have to take in as much knowledge as you can. You, you constantly have to be out there looking, uh, you, know, you know, networking is the key word, networking, networking, networking. Um, you know, using LinkedIn, using these, these social media tools to remain current and active with this database because a lot of times people get the job because they knew somebody in there and they knew this is a proven character. Or, you know, sometimes a lot of people, you know, they you know, they go for a job interview or whatnot like that and they don't get the job, you know, but just to send that response, thank you, you know, disappointed I didn't get it, but please keep me in mind, keeping that current connection fresh. You know, maybe they liked you, but they just went with somebody who was a tiny bit more experienced. So, you know, the next time that could be your in. You know, remain linked in with that person. And I guess, I guess just the, the end point would be just remain positive. I've just, I've interviewed so many people that get sour over the years, and it's, they're great people, they've got great skills, but they just come off so sour and so negative in a job interview, and it's, you know, you, you as, a, as a, you know, if, if you're not, you know, it depends on who you're talking to, I may see that and say, okay, you're fine, you know, I understand where you're coming from, but, you know, most people aren't going to have that point of view, you know, so just to remain positive and hopeful and just keep plugging away. You know, you may apply to a hundred things in a week. It'd be nice if there were that many jobs that's out there in a week, but you know, but just you know, you may not hear from any of them. It's difficult sometimes. You may not hear back, but just keep your head up, be positive, keep taking information, always continue to better yourself. I could just add on these comments real quick. Uh, two quick stories. Um, our current HR administrator, I interviewed her three years ago. And I was down to two candidates, she was a finalist as someone else was. Well I chose the other candidate over her just for a certain skill set. Well, that person eventually got promoted and 
because we remained LinkedIn connected and checked in there each other, two years ago I went back and said, hey, are you still interested in an opportunity? And she jumped in it, so she's now part of our staff. So it's really a good connection to always make sure that you have those positive and maintain that relations. Another quick story just happened actually yesterday. So I worked with 10 years ago, and I haven't seen him for probably about eight years. Um, he actually emailed me. He lives in Texas now and says, hey, are you interested in an opportunity down here? I've got a senior level HR position, and I thought of you first. So once again, I wasn't looking. I'm not looking. But he reached out to me first and said, hey, I know what you can bring to the table, and I thought you'd be a great fit for it. So keeping that connection and just staying in touch, even if it's only once a year, hey, just check in. How you doing? You know, you know I'm still out here. That can lead to something down the road. seen that in our company in the past where, you know, a manager likes someone because they're doing so well in that functional area. I, I can't lose them from that because they're doing such a great job. I don't want to move them. So it's really, it's a, it's, you have to work, have, the company has to work on that culture and understand that this is our future talent. Yes, they're great there, but what else can they bring to the table and move them forward? So it really has to be with the company itself. Not much you can do other than highlight and showcase how you can be an asset in a different role and still commit that. I can still train the next person behind me to still be as successful as I was in this role. So showing the positive how you can get someone to your level and also how you can get that next level and really have that open dialogue with your, your management team to say, I want to do more for this company. It's definitely keep the communication lines open with with your manager. You know, um, In my current position, I was, I was lucky enough to have my predecessor move to another department. So he's a building over. So that was a win for them because if I had come in from scratch, it would have been a lot more of a learning curve for me because I didn't have my predecessor there to, to really rely on and, and kind of learn the ropes from this person. So like you know, he was saying, just make sure, you know, it, it's nice to have that person still on staff to be able to relate to. So that's that's your selling point right there. You know, hey, I can move up, but I'm still here. You know, maybe I can create a procedural manual or train this person or whatnot like that. But you know, you're not going to lose that high quality work. You know, I'll be here to train the next great person, and I'll be moving on to something else. So I think it's nice to come into a situation with here's this issue, but here's the solution. Because I'm pretty sure you can relate. A lot of people come in with here's the issue. What's my solution, HR? You know, so it's it's you know, you know, so it's it's to come in with the solution or a suggestion of how we can fix this this issue is it, it's a win that situation. They really like that. Something else to keep in mind, it might be a good idea to bring that up at a review time. Uh, if you feel like you're not being heard, I know when I'm reviewing my staff, I always want to hear at the end, you know, how do you feel things are going, or was there something that I didn't mention in this review that you think was important? Um, you have their attention. It's usually one-on-one, -on -one, um, and that might be a good time to, to bring it up, and especially, you know, if you have your your details and your examples in front of you, and like you said, you know, problem and solution, you probably going to have a better chance to get heard. So when I, when I first became a uh, job coach um, back at Wegmans many years ago, um, I knew that was a great opportunity, I loved it, but it was not the for me. I wanted to make that next step happen because I had other skills. So I then became a HR generalist and part of that was I wanted to broaden my experience so I did pursue the, uh, the PHR certification. Um, that is sort of your, your baseline, gives you all the you know, employee relations benefits, labor law, really in, you know, in tune to what, what all the aspects of HR are. Um, so I did that um, as an employer rep and then I knew once again I wanted to get my crit next level so I did have an opportunity to become a director of HR and prior to doing that I wanted to show that I was qualified for that, so I pursued my SPHR, or Senior Professional Human Resources. I was actually lucky enough that uh, a colleague through networking uh, said, well, Rob, I know you like facilitating and teaching. Would you mind teaching the course, preparation course for it? So here I was preparing for the course myself and teaching at the same time, so it was sort of a, a, a double benefit for myself. So um, I became SPHR certified about three years ago. And how I maintain that is, like I mentioned earlier, a lot of the local, the RBA seminars, um, National Sherm Conference once every couple of years. Anytime you can find something through one of the local memberships, many of them are free. Some are very low cost, you know, $20 for an event, um, and you get your CECs that way. Um, with those certifications, you can even do it for first-time job experience. Um, 
unfortunately, Pine State went through a mini layoff for our first time in history about six months ago. That was the first time experience for me, so I was able to document that and to get credit hours toward that. So pretty much anything you do within HR is something you can document toward a certification experience. So that's how I got it. I am not right now. My, my plate is too full, unfortunately. <laughs> but some great resources for you if you've Thank done you. it. Thank yes, you. Yes, absolutely. <laughs>
it was base plus commission based on your placements. You know, the more placements we made, the better we were, um, and the better the commission was. Um, how I got their attention, I was networking. I, I had started talking with this organization around the time that I was getting ready to graduate from college for the second time, and they didn't have anything at that point. But I continued to follow up with them, and then out of the, literally out of the blue, maybe two years later, I was looking to grow in another position with another organization that they didn't currently have anything, and they had wanted to, this, this organization, the staffing agency, called me and said, would you still be in the running for this? Would you be interested in this role and this recruiter? But you tend to do a lot more functions for you know, these organizations once you get to know them. And I said, well, sure. Once I heard what they had to say, you know, I was sold on it, and you know, the rest is history, so to speak. But really, I it was it's a long-term networking deal, that I really was just networking with them, and I got their attention. But as we were talking about with many of the cover letters and resumes, I had to really kind of tailor how my experience and how my background up to that point really met what they were looking for. And at that point, I mean, I had a little bit of professional experience. I, I started off at Paychex for a while, so I, I worked in one of their HR call centers there, you know, handling benefits and different things like that. And before that, it was all retail, but I was management in retail. So I had hired people for front end. I would hired people for cashiers. I had done recruitment of those individuals and people for the cashier's office and et cetera and et cetera. So I really had to play to those skills when I was talking with this organ. So maybe it didn't directly, I didn't come right from another agency, but I sold my way and I sold myself in the fashion of I do have these skills and they will transfer. And also it's a challenging role for me because I can learn so much too. So sometimes they want people that are more. Very good written, a well written job description actually lists the duties in criticalness. So the top duty is mostly the most important to that organization. So I look at those focus groups first. You know, if you have 30, look at the top 10 and really kind of focus on them. Or see if there's repeated themes. Sometimes you'll have three duties that are all kind of similar, so kind of tailor to a bucket. Um, the other thing is not just look at the job description, look at the company's website or their culture and talk about that within your cover letter. Because once again, you can train skill, you can't always train culture or soft skills. So try to work on focusing on that, the culture aspect, along with the specific qualifications. And looking over okay. and looking over resumes, if there's 30 requirements, I don't know how many resumes are really going to meet all those 30. So you're really looking at, okay, well this person has uh, the, the amount of experience we want and they have the education, they may not be using our programs, but they've got the experience, they've got the education, they come and they have an interview, they have a positive attitude, I think this is somebody that we can really work with. So we're looking for required skills, but when we have that many, I don't think there's an employer out there that's really expecting to match all of them. And also maybe you want to list the ones that you're most strong to say at, you're most comfortable with. My first thing, and I've seen a lot of resumes come through like that, in your cover letter, I would explain why. Don't let it become the elephant in the room. Because there's a lot of resumes that we get for entry-level positions in our accounting department from CPAs. Why are they? You know, they're obviously at, you know, the job market is poor. You know, what else could be a reason? I would bring it right out and explain this is why I'm looking to do that. Don't let us try to make that decision or assumption for you. I would just say that's perfect. I mean, I, I think the same thing. Once you get it out there, you know, you don't need to go into a long dissertation to cover that as, you know, here's what I'm transitioning in life. And I want to, but, but get it out there as to, you know, I'm willing to be part of an organization that you use my skill set at a different level. Um, once again, many times we'll get uh, just applications at, at our organization and they get passed for salary requirements. Well, sometimes managers will make assumptions based on someone who is at a high level salary. We can't pay them that. I always tell them, well, you can't assume they want that. Okay, so let's look at what, what are they looking, what are they applying for. Disregard the salary level or how, how seasoned they are, look at the skill set. Why, you need to find out why are they making this move now. And that's the question we ask them. So call attention to it right away. Right, right. Just to go off that as well, if I uh, was looking for taking an accounting position in another type of industry, I wouldn't be looking at a director level. 
I've done most of my experience has been at this industry. So if I was changing my industry, you know, going into the medical field or going into a manufacturing, I would definitely be looking to take a step back so that I understood more of what was going on, and that would be a part of my problem. We follow a lot of different uh, industry key performance indicators out there. We have a couple of clients we work with that kind of give us our pathway forward and what they're seeing as trends. Um, then they predicted this double dip recession a while ago, which we've not seen that, thank goodness. Uh, but I think a lot of companies they serve, that we work with are still holding tight to their cars. They want to kind of wait, kind of wait and see approach. So they're not really in a growth mode, or growth mode, excuse me. Uh, we're sort of that same way. We're, we're, we're growing by exception. Have a critical need, we'll put it out there. But right now, we're just sort of just kind of wait and see what's happening with the, the market, our customers. Um, we're doing well, but you know, you can always do better. I think uh, the predictions are by the end of the, or this summer, things are going to turn around a little better. We're going to start seeing more growth. Um, but right now, for what we're seeing, what we're hearing, it's sort of just kind of we're just going to hold steady right now, just to kind of see what happens, um, especially with all the health care reform changes, the tax law changes. There's a lot of things that are impacting a lot of businesses, especially in, in our area, you know, upstate New York, where it's going to be getting hit a lot harder than the rest of the country in many aspects. So it, is it coming? We hear yes. Um, are we there yet? It's going to be a little time for some more, still some more recovery. Also, I, would just, I was just thinking, as Rob was speaking, a lot of times you base the job market on what you're seeing on Indeed or Career Builder or the DNC or whatever, and a lot of times, like we were kind of preaching to, you know, being network, ne networking with people, using LinkedIn and different like that. I think a lot of times, sometimes if you, you know, it may not even go to post, you know, sometimes there may be a need there that they want to hire for, but they know, this, you know, they know such and such from five interviews ago and they're going to offer it to this particular person before it even gets there. So I think sometimes remaining active, you know, with your contacts, you know, remaining active in the community, you know, being the mover and shaker, selling yourself out there, so to speak, I think will open up an avenue to different job postings that may be, I mean, they may be thinking about you know, this particular position, and you know, Bob, Bob would be great for this role. You know, they're still going to post it, but you're a prime candidate, you know, so I think, you know, heading it off at the past sometimes, uh, you know, with regards to, you know, Bob, there's not a lot of jobs out here right now. They may be out there. They might not just be using Career Builder or LinkedIn or Post of Rochester Works or wherever. So I think communicating and remaining active in the community also helps, too, so just from a different perspective. savvy about it because they only give you, I mean, if you're, if you don't know the person and you're writing them, I think you only have like 140 characters or something like that. We were able to kind of write this little elevator speech, so to speak, and, you know, here's who I am and here's what I'm looking to do. Um, I think the default is I'd like to link in with you or something like that. So, I mean, I, I think you'd never want to go with something as generic as that because the person, who knows what this person's intentions are. I mean, even I'll get them now and if it's just very generic, uh, is it a bot, you know, is it the scammer, you know, what's going on here? Why does this person want to link? So I think definitely being very creative in regards to how you respond to these people in regards to, hey, you know, I'm, I'm, learning, I'm looking to learn more about this particular industry. I, you know, I, I'm, you know, I'm a potential job candidate. Would it, be, would, it be, would it be okay to link in with you? But read their profile, too, because they'll actually list on the bottom, you know, I'm available for, you know, if you're looking for a job, career opportunities. It'll tell them what they want to, it'll tell you what they want to be linked in about. Also, there's another feature, like maybe you know me and you want to link in to Kim over here, there's an introduction feature where you can actually ask me, as somebody you're already in your first circle, so to speak, to, I can introduce you to Kim. And if I know you, then I probably, okay, great, Sally's great, you know, let me introduce her to Kim, you know, let me help her out. So, And once you know the person, you can actually, it's, it's almost set up, once you're in your first circle, you get more than that 140 character kind of little byline of, here, this is why I'm reaching out to you. So I think, uh, you know, Using that tool is beneficial too, but I mean, lay it on the line. I mean, just you know, but be focused and creative about it. You know, I would like to learn more about your profession, or I would like, you know, I'm looking for a career in your profession. Would I be able to link in with you? Or connect with you? You know, and they'll be open to that. I'm open to that when people write me. I'm pretty sure everybody here on the panel is pretty much open to that. So, hey, let me help this person out. Let me pay it forward. So. That's a great. I think we're, we're all very really open to the more savvy introduction. <laughs> Uh, if it just says, I like to link in with you. Wow, well, if you're a sales rep or if you're just trying to, you know, some 
listening for something, but you say, we can learn more about your industry, more about your company, and we can connect with you. I'm more receptive to that person as well. Uh, for us, you know, it depends on the position. Um, it's, if it's a higher level position, we will do a much more exhaustive search. If it's a management position or higher, we you know, will use various means. Um, our philosophy is always, you know, you can get it free, great, but you always have to pay for something at, at some point. So we try to go from free to low cost, lower cost to high cost. But it really depends on the position. If we're looking for an entry level operations position, we'll probably go the, the free or low cost route. If we're looking for a senior leader, then we're going to use a search firm that specializes in that area. So it really just depends on the position we're looking for and how exhausted we want to use that search. Um, sometimes we have a plan and that plan doesn't work out so we can take that next level step. Um, for me personally, I try to use LinkedIn as, you know, just to put it out there that, hey, Klein Steel is hiring for this right now. Do you know anybody? Please contact us at employment at kleinsteel.com. Once again, because of the networks, you do get some hits off that because someone knows someone who knows someone and they contact you. Um, but we don't use LinkedIn as a recruiting service as part of their services yet. It's not because we have a high turnover. It's because we're getting in more student loan, defaulted student loan collections from universities than as bodies we have to actually make those calls and try to get those arrangements set up. Um, so if you're looking for trying to get a, a position in your field but haven't found that yet, it is something that it's actually always there and we're listed everywhere. We're in the DNC. Um, we're in. offices in Buffalo and Rochester, and we're always hiring. The last five hires in my department have been debt counselors. They didn't have a, they didn't have a, uh, we didn't have an opening in the finance department at the time. They took job as debt counselors. When the position opened up in finance, every time we've had an opening, we always open up internally first. It's a lot easier to you know, look at resumes and interview five internal employees than it is to look at 150 incoming. Uh, so, yeah, that's, and two of them have actually moved on and are now in management positions. One is a financial analyst, analyst manager, and somebody uh, has also been promoted over into our purchasing department. So, yeah, it's, it's a great way to start. If you are really interested in being with the company, you can get an entry-level position in another department. I would make it one of your questions in an interview is how they feel about, you know, hiring within or crossing departments. Some of them aren't as easy to do it. Some companies aren't, but, but we like to do that. We encourage it. So we do have electronic, you can submit your interest or you can submit a resume, but it doesn't give a lot of detail for us. So what I like saying is it's a fine balance of one to contact and one to overburden. Um, I've had several folks who've contacted me and said, you know, Rob, I just want to let you know I applied there yesterday. Here's what my skill sets are in a very brief, you know, synopsis, and here's what I'm looking for. Please take a look at my resume and get back to me if you get a chance. Very simple. It's not, you know, I'm looking for an interview. I'm looking for this. We know what you're looking for. Just say, here's what I bring to the table again. Um, if you get a chance, I'd love to hear from you. Leave it at that. And then if we don't hear from you, then no, okay, it's probably not going in that direction. But many times, those kind of calls, I'll then go to my recruiter and say, hey, I got this call. Can you pull his resume for me? Because it's once again, it's that courteous professional introduction almost, like a LinkedIn introduction, but via the voicemail. For me, I would look at cover letter. Once again, it's the selling point. Maybe it's been 20 years ago, but explain how your experience matches and maybe what you've done to remain current with those particular skills. Because even though it's 20 years ago, maybe you still know how to do it because you've been currently active in whatever group or whatever training or what, not like that. And once again, use those key words when you're drafting your cover letter. And I think that would be a huge selling point for me. Again, you want to make sure that you tell them you're willing to learn your learn and you know you have the basics but then you want to update your skills and you're, willing to, you're more than willing to learn. I think too I mean there's a lot of different ways to format a resume out there. It really needs to go to what what is most important to that company. 
some companies are focused on education, so you want to list that first. Some is more on the experience, so you want to list that first. What I should generally do in my own resume back from years ago is my summary of qualification, the very first thing. This way it kind of highlights exactly what I'm bringing to the table before I even get into my education or work experience or certifications. Those are all great supporting experiences, but really it's what is that summary? What's the key of what I can bring to the table? Put that first. That's the first thing we're going to look at is the first you know, quarter of the page, but basically. If it passes that test, then we're going to read further. I would say is um, stay positive, keep at it, and keep learning. And do things like this. I mean, you, the more often you attend different things, the year, there's 30 different people in here you can network with, and the four of us as well. So you just never know who's connected to who. So networking is a big thing. Learning is a big aspect of that. So just and, and being positive. You know, the market is tough. There's no one denying that. Um, it will get better. It's, it's, history shows it will get better, right? So we will come out of this, and we will have opportunities, and just be flexible with what you're looking for. It may not be the exact same salary, the exact right position, but you never know what that could be. Like I said, I, I went into a job coach. My background is fitness. I love fitness. I just transitioned and it's worked out for me.